It's time for the 88 kilogram final. Giancarlo! Athletes will often overemphasize or overestimate an opponent's ability based on the introduction they have. People looked at John Carlo previously as just this kind of like positional guy that wasn't very dangerous. And he tended to look at other people as world champions. And when he held that belief, everyone else believed the same fucking thing. John Carlo is one of those dark horses, I think, in this division. He's like right on the cusp of like being able to beat the best guys on any given day. And as time went by, the combination of what was happening in the room and what was happening in competition started to create a very new vision in his mind. I just beat the Black Belt World Champion and the last ADCC Champion. It's my fucking weekend. Okay, fellas, on to our next one. Placido and Giancarlo are in a position where Placido likes to sit up, expose his waist to a body lock. Take it away, buddy. He's here, he goes to sit up. I like to get my knee right inside of his feet here. I shoot my head into my training partner's wallet bone. I crash down, locking my hand, and get into a nice tight body lock here. I like to train with the best athlete in every discipline. You know, if, uh, these guys are the best rappers in the world. Like, I have a chance to, to go with them, and it's an experience that I that not a lot of people can can have. You know. Okay, I'm gonna look, start stepping over his knee from here. So I step my leg up. I keep right knee nice and tight, keeping his foot compressed. I start walking heel toe until I can get my knee over his knee. Switch my head across to the other side. I pinch one. Right leg back steps, we come through, and we control him here with the pass. My name is Giancarlo Bodoni. I'm a black belt under Lucas Lepri, and I train currently under John Danaher in Austin, Texas, representing New Wave. I grew up in Florida, so I was born and raised in Florida. Um, I've pretty much been doing martial arts my entire life since I was about five years old not with any intention or background, like no desire to pursue it as a career. But I ultimately found Jiu Jitsu when I was about 12. But for whatever reason, when I started Jiu Jitsu, I was just immediately drawn to it. I think just the fact that I was naturally competitive and it was more of an individual sport. So there was that, that element to it. But what keeps me interested in Jiu Jitsu is just that I'm always learning new things. And then as I kind of got older and had more opportunities to compete and I saw kind of more of a path that I could take with jiu-jitsu. It just kind of organically turned into this career. So it was always something that I was passionate about it since a relatively young age. And yeah, here we are. So once again, we're doing a good job at taking this guy, but he's a good guy too. And he hips forward and passes our foot to the inside. Like, fuck, tripod's gone. The one direction he can't stop our foot from going. I, he can always stop my foot going back to a tripod, but he can't stop my foot going underneath and through. Now I use my second foot to gather up his leg and we go double leg Ashi to knock this guy down and he score our points. Okay, let's give it a try, fellas. John Carlo was an uke or demonstration partner who uh, lived in Boston. He worked at the school of Bernardo Faria. But I was filming a video which featured the gi and some takedown work. I worked with John Carlo. He really impressed me, both as a jiu-jitsu person and just as a person in general. He's a very hard-working, very conscientious young man, and we struck up a friendship. Intermittent, I would occasionally go down to New York once every couple months, train for a couple days, come back to Boston, and that's kind of how the relationship started. He would come down and train with us in New York, and he had a 
and he had a rough time in training because everyone would just leg lock him. And things that he had never seen before, like body lock guard passes, just worked 100% on him every time. And he, he would come out of training sessions like, like, dude, I just got my guard pass like 20 times. And I just got leg locked by everyone in the room. It was kind of discouraging. But he had this very good demeanor and attitude. We would just keep coming back. I would go up to Boston and film and we'd always talk about jiu-jitsu. And as time went by, we did more and more videos together. Pretty much my entire jiu-jitsu life, I was coming up as a gi competitor. And so one thing that I had almost no background in at all, besides like maybe like, you know, a knee bar and like a toe hold was leg locks. So I had no idea about heel hooks at all. He trained around at various camps in the United States for a while. And he did local tournaments, EBI type tournaments, and would often get leg locked by people that, if there were no leg locks, he would defeat them easily. But with leg locks, he was, he was really struggling. The first actual encounter that I had that was kind of like a wake up call was I did the BJ Fanatics Invitational. And it was like the first one that they had and they had it at Travis Stevens gym. Um, they like broadcasted it on YouTube or something. And Gordon was actually commenting on that one. And I remember that I was like crushing this guy. It was an EBI rules match. So I was like passing this guy's guard multiple times, mounted him, did everything. And he would just like shell up and then find an opportunity to recover. And he kept trying to enter my legs. And at one point he got a heel hook on me and I just, didn't know which way to turn, and he ended up tearing my, uh, breaking my knee. Giancarlo is essentially dominating the match, but just can't find a way to isolate any of his limbs to actually break through and get to a win. But now enters into his legs. He got a 50-50 here. And that's, that's, that's a nice inverted heel hook. When he first came to train with us, I think you may remember he went in a WNO event and fought Kenan Duarte and he lost the match. But positionally I thought he did well. But my big criticism at the end of it was like, John Carlo, you look positionally sound, but at no point did Kenan ever fear you. Like he he literally had no fear of your technique. He felt no threat. And I've always believed in Jiu-Jitsu. Your opponent's performance against you will always be directly proportional to how much fear they have of you. If they don't fear you, they will use 100% of their arsenal against you. But if they fear you, they will pull back with many of their techniques and they will fight you with a substantially lower percentage of their arsenal out of fear for the consequences of screwing up when they fight against you. And so this whole thing was, John Carlo, we've got to make you dangerous. And so we started a program based around strangles and joint locks, where in the gym he had to start finishing people. And in a remarkably short period of time, I must say, John Carlo turned his game around. It's out, it's out. John Carlo finished with the heel hook. Somebody who's a fan of that team's work gets underneath here, he's gonna get the tap. This is very fun <laughs> to watch. Giancarlo Abodani is gonna move on. You see your opponent coming up as you go to do this, coming up, that'll give you another opportunity to go in to get to your reach off. Stop putting people down. It's been the quickest technical evolution that I've had in my entire life. So, I mean, I've been training for a long time, been training for over a decade, almost 15 years, and I developed a strong foundation in all that time training, a really strong positional game, good submission attacks, but I feel like my game's become so much more well rounded under John's eyes. He has a different view of tactics and his ability to plant seeds in his athletes has been a huge game changer for me. So I feel like I've just evolved in the last six months more than I've evolved in the last uh, five years. I looked at ADCC 2022 as an experimental year, given that we had had a very, very severe team breakup less than a year before ADCC. I believed that it was somewhat unlikely that we would be able to create a winning team in, in one year. The well-known no-gi jiu-jitsu team headed by John Danaher is to be disbanded. The Danaher Death Squad 
is no more. And so I said, okay, well, if you can't create a winning team for 2022, let's just see what we can do. Let's have an experiment. Let's get the guys their first ADCC and get them used to competition and, and let's see what happens. We really needed just people in the team to train with Gordon and Gary. We just had no one. So I was delighted. I mean, this kid was great. He was a great person, great human being. So we came down, started training. And first thing we said is, that, John Carly, you, you, you have to learn how to defend a leg lock. Like, you can't just go on like this anymore. So that was project number one. John Carlo, you're very strong positionally, but you got, you're not dangerous at all. You're not, you, no one feels threatened when they go up against you. In general, we started pushing them towards submissions. About six months in front of ADCC, he hit a series of beautiful looking submission holds. Everything from leg locks to arm locks to triangles to strangle holds from both front and back. At the end of the day, he got up off the mat walked towards me and we went to shake hands, he smiled and I said, you had a good day, didn't you? And he just went, and I was like, okay, he's changing. I mean, I've trained with him dozens of times and uh, he's, he's like right on the cusp of like being able to, to beat the best guys on, on any given day. I feel amazing, man. You know, I've been eyeballing this tournament for months now and I knew in my head, I was like, I have to be at the next ADCC. That was my goal. I punched my ticket. I'm happy, and uh, yeah, I'm without words, man. Interestingly, one of the great quotes of the ADCC camp came from Nicholas Marigali, who just had a very grueling session with John Carlo. And you know, Nicholas is a weight division above. To, to get a workout like that from John Carlo, this is Nicholas Marigali we're talking about here, you know, that's, that's impressive. He comes over to me and sits down, doesn't say a word for about three minutes, then he looks at me and goes, you know what John Carlo's problem is? And I go, what's that? He goes, he doesn't know how good he is. And he just got up and walked away. <laughs> I was saying, it's a solid point. But in ADCC 2022, John Carlo figured out how good he is. This was going to be electric. The stands are already filling up. I'm going to go around try to bring you guys the sights and sounds of ADCC World Championships. Couldn't be more excited. So, man, let's get to it. All the lights, all the pictures, the graphics, it's dope as fuck. Look at this shit. It's Right here is something special, man. This is so big for the jiu-jitsu community, man. <laughs> this production is unreal. You're gonna have a packed stadium. Mo Jassim's gone really out of his way to make things bigger and better. You just have great feeling. It's like <laughs> we've been recording right now, and we're being part of it. I never fought in a stage like this in jiu-jitsu. Andre's main problem is he has no way to make me respect him. So. I think it's gonna be tough. I think it's gonna be tough for Andre. Woo! Let's go, USA! This feels like we're at like an MMA weigh-ins here. This is amazing, you know. We've never had a crowd like this in, you know, professional grappling before. And you know, what better place to do it in PDCC here in Las Vegas. So I don't know if it's gonna happen, but a match that I would love to see, and since I've always been a big Josh Hinger fan, I would love to see him and Giancarlo Badoni. I, I, I think Badoni has just had the craziest like no-gi year. He's just been beating a lot of people and he might have not beat everybody, but from where he was a year ago to where he is now is incredible. I just love both of their styles and I think they're so different that it would be really interesting to see how they actually match up. The place is packed, the stage is set. The only thing left to do is run this shit. Let's go, baby. And now, your 2022 ADCC World Championships brackets reveal. 
All right, here we go. There's Giancarlo Bodoni, a, a black belt under Lucas Lepre, now training with the New Wave team down in Austin, Texas. Awesome grappler, very good everywhere. He's been working a lot on his takedown game. Yeah, he is one of those dark horses, I think, in this division. Tell me, uh, how do you feel about your bracket? Super pumped. I mean, I think Flo actually said that I would go with Izaki first round. I trained for more than 10 months for this tournament. I've been waiting for this day forever. So, however it lines up, it lines up. So I'm just ready to go tomorrow. There was more people for a bracket reveal than there are in most grappling shows. So I think the ADCC Freeverse has finally caught on. And you know, I said years ago that this ADCC was going to be different. And I think people are starting to realize that. All right, guys. Well, there you have it. We have all the brackets, all the matchups. Flow grappling all day. Let's go. Woo! So when I drew Izaki, even though I knew that he was going to be a tough opponent, obviously he's a former world champion, I knew that it would be a tough match. I knew that he would be physical, but I was extremely confident. I felt that I had prepared myself to the best of my ability to beat pretty much anybody in that bracket. All right, we are underway. Round of 16 match here in the under 88 kilogram division. For me, every single match, I just wanted to put pressure on guys and just kind of make them break over time. So from the beginning of the match, I already felt him getting uncomfortable in the standing position. Then I pulled guard, did the same thing from bottom. And then I could feel that when he started playing a negative game, that that was when I knew that I could start increasing the pace and start really uh, pushing forward. There it is, yes, there it is. Oh, oh this is big. Score. Huge, huge score here from Bodani. He'll get his three, already threatening with the with the right arm. Here he oh, goes. He's in, he's in position, BMAC. When I was fighting him, I was just fighting a guy, and I was just reading his responses, but I didn't really worry too much about what he was gonna do. I just went out there and I did my thing, and I just kept pressure on him the whole time. I thought that I dominated pretty much the entire match. And your winner wow. and moving forward to face Mateus Denise. It's going to be New Wave's Giancarlo Bodani. To beat Izaki in, in competition is absolute hell. And with just like seconds left on the clock, has a full stranglehold on and is about to finish when time runs out. Gets up off the mat, walks right over to me and goes, I can't believe I didn't finish him. Uh, I was thrilled. I was there, you know, I said, wow, that was a great match. He just looks at me with disgust and he's like, I can't believe I didn't finish him. And I was like, this kid's gonna, he's got the right mindset. This is, this is what you want to hear out of an athlete. Pacey expected. Obviously super tough and experienced as a world champion, so he knows how to compete, but I just felt that I had the size, the attributes, and the skill level to beat him, so it was only a matter of time to before what happened, happened. How are you feeling going into the second match? Feel good, feel fresh, ready to go. I think it's safe to say that Giancarlo has made more progress, more technical, technical and tactical progress in this last year with us than he did in his entire career combined leading up until that point. Like when I met Giancarlo and I trained with him in Boston, but I could like literally do whatever I wanted to him. I could, I could play top, I could play bottom, and I would just beat him up from every position. And now it's like a war when we train. The generation changed so much since the last ADCC. The style of grappling change. Yeah, it's, it's just so much stuff. You got, got a lot of new guys that can shock the world. So I think that's one thing that makes it exciting. So second round, I pulled Mateus Denise. He was the reigning champion. I had a game plan. I knew the techniques that I was good at. I understood the rule set. So facing Mateus or facing anybody, it was irrelevant to me because I just felt that I could strategize and compete against any opponent. Like I didn't need a specific style to make me to make me uh, perform well. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back once again. It is Matt One. It is Mateos Denise, the returning oh, champion no. versus Giancarlo Badoni. Look at this arm drag from Giancarlo. Puts Mateos down. But Giancarlo Badoni putting on the pressure right away, forcing Mateos to adopt a half guard. As the match went on, I could feel him breaking down over time, which was my game plan for all the matches. The, you're not never the same fighter in the first minute that you are in the seventh or eighth minute. So it was, I already felt a different athlete in front of me. Denise does have two minutes until points come into effect. 
As I say that, looks to get right back underneath, back up, and puts Giancarlo on his back. I felt that he had a good moment in the match, and he lost it, and that's pretty demoralizing, especially when the match isn't going your way for most of the time. Giancarlo came at the match with a completely different perspective. He said, I'm going to stand up and wrestle this guy. If you can turn someone's shoulders, you can get them hopping. If you can get them hopping, you can make their leg weightless. And if you can make the leg weightless, you can sweep it away. And a big foot sweep over the top. Interestingly, at one point, out of a scramble, he actually had his back taken. And thankfully, that's where all the defensive positional work that we do in almost every workout that my athletes ever do kicked in and he easily escaped the position. Uh, I was very proud of the fact that he was able to take um, an athlete who embodies the back control principles of someone as great as Marcelo Garcia and easily escape from the back position and then turn it up. Great job of fixing his hips and getting back in a body lock position. Mateus Denise arguing with the ref, saying that he stopped. If you really look at the footage, there really isn't any controversy. I shook him off my back and I immediately went straight to a body lock and locked my hands. He was trying to say that my hands weren't locked when we were on the edge. I was already ready from that edge of the mat to take him down whether it was going to be outside of the mat or inside of the mat because I knew that I couldn't stop based on ADCC rules. So I had a body lock, my hips were in, the referee said stop, and my hands were locked and I didn't unlock them on purpose as soon as he stopped us. So he looks back, sees that my hands were locked, then we go back to center um, and he was kind of complaining about it. Immediately getting taken down, definitely pleading with the ref, saying that he stopped when the action was called to stop. That's going to be four points for Giancarlo Bodoni. Off of a very confusing position, too. You see Mateo Denise seems a little discouraged now. you got to keep scrapping at ADCC until you're physically told to stop. But one thing I will say about Giancarlo is that he has a very good integration of positional and submission game. And when you can integrate position and submission, you can generate motion. And where there's motion, there's going to be submissions. Drop back for an arm. Potentially looking for a submission here. Now locking up the triangle over the top. Will this be it for Mateo Stiniz? This is a tight lock on the neck. And that is it. Giancarlo Bodoni submits the returning champ. Punches his ticket to Sunday. I thought it was one of the best submissions of the tournament. It was a beautifully applied triangle on a, on a former champion. Very, very difficult to do. And you know, how many people can say they've submitted Mateus Denise in no-gi competition? Very, very few. Coming to match one, Lucas the Hope Barbosa and Let's go, Josh baby. Hinger. How do you feel? I just beat the Black Bar World Champion and the last ADCC champion. So, how do you think I feel? Fucking amazing, dude. It's my fucking weekend. John Carlo walked into the whole event with barely a set of eyes on him. People were like, oh yeah, that guy. Um, the trials winner guy. They, he flew in completely under the radar. And I think that's when people were truly shocked. Like, not many Americans know who Izaki is. Like, it, all the Brazilians know he's damn good. But Americans don't typically know much about him. But every American knows who Mateus Denise was. Oh, that's the guy that beat Craig Jones. And, and, and he's the gold medalist. And suddenly you hit this guy that no one paid attention to, not just beating him, but like, hitting two highlight reel takedowns on him and then finishing him with like a picture perfect triangle. And at that moment, I think everyone was like, damn, like, this guy's really good. Are you looking for that triangle from the back? I'm looking to finish everybody, so I came really close twice. But Izaki, he's fucking tough. He Sorry, toughed guys, it out. He toughed it out. I had a super good uh, rear naked attempt, but he was able to get out, so credit to him. I was pissed that I lost that, but 
once I locked the uh, the ankles in Kaku, I knew it was done against Mateus. So I could feel him breaking as the match went on, and I knew it was a matter of time that he would open something up and I'd be able to finish him. Who's up first for you tomorrow? Uh, I'm not sure yet. I don't know how the brackets are laid out. Maybe Mason or O'Flanagan, whoever wins that. So it'll be a good, uh, good weekend. Thanks for tomorrow. Yes. Oh, in the first oh, yes. Oh, man. Fowler ripping hard on a heel hook. Both yes. guys ripping a heel hook. Yeah, he's slipping on Fowler's in some trouble. Tap. He's going to get the tap. Oh, and O'Flanagan. Oh, and O'Flanagan. Mason Fowler dropped back on the heel on the outside. He barely had any of O'Flanagan's heel. O'Flanagan uses the opportunity to counter with his own outside heel. Wow. Owen oh, O'Flanagan moves on to day two. Your European Trials champion is going to move on to face Giancarlo Bodani in the semifinals. So are you at all any, uh, any extra concern going into that match with Owen? Um, to be honest, not really, because uh, Giancarlo works out daily with people who are at the top of the leg lock game. So um, if you can defend yourself against people like Gordon Ryan and Gary Tonin, you're probably not going to have difficulties with anyone else. So uh, I was very confident. In general, in Jiu-Jitsu, it's much easier to teach someone to stop or frustrate a submission hold than it is to apply the submission hold. The principles of defense are usually easier to convey and learn than the principles of offense. So. Um, Giancarlo had a pretty easy time. We did see quite a bit of Giancarlo Badoni yesterday. He is wearing the black rash guard and shorts. Owen O'Flanagan in the spats and black rash guard. And we're about to get going. Let's jump in. Winner of this will face the winner of Lucas Barbosa and Wagner Rocha immediately pulling guard as Owen O'Flanagan, something we saw him do all day yesterday. I knew that he was a heavy leg locker, and I don't like to keep too much of an emphasis on what my opponent's going to do but I like to focus more on what I'm gonna do, but I just wanted to be aware of like what his major entries were. But regardless, I felt really good in my uh, leg defense, so I didn't think it was gonna be a huge start, but obviously you gotta be, you gotta be ready for anybody. Inverting over, exposing a little bit of the heel, but Padoni is in the right place, the right team to really know his way around some leg locks. So he's pretty leg lock heavy, so he, he'll avoid taking like say top position just to fall back on a leg. So what I wanted was to attack him with that toe hold, force him to turn and then go in and take his back. Ono Flanagan, he has his right leg caught underneath and he's looking for the reap, he's got it. He is very strong in these situations, pulling his head over the foot to try to maintain the knee line, but Madoni doing a great job getting out of that entanglement. I wanted to kind of break him down, test his guard, see what his entries were and things like that. But he was so fixated on my leg that when I got, once I got the good bite, by the time it was time for him to address it, his foot had already popped and um, yeah, it was, it was too late. Oh, and here we go! Man, he is slick with these entries. Bodoni uses his left foot to clear his right knee line. He's not completely out of the woods yet. Oh, and Bodoni returns one of his own and he's in the final. Advancing to the final is your winner by submission on map number one. ago that was you could have said one of my weaknesses like I suffered most of my black belt losses due to leg lock so if I didn't have the team support that I have with John and Gordon all the amazing leg lock guys that I do maybe I wouldn't have had the same outcome if we were in this exact same match two years ago but I've turned what was one of my once my weakness into one of my strengths so just happy I felt comfortable in all the exchanges and what happened happened So immediately after, I wanted to see the other semifinal, which was Hulk and Wagner. Just looking to see 
uh, one who wins, just so I know who my opponent's gonna be, see kind of how the match goes. Like, okay, was it a tough match? What did he win relatively easy? So it wasn't too surprising, like his approach. The first thing I'm looking for as a coach is I'm looking at their body language. You don't know who's going to win, so I study their body language. I want to pick up on the subtle cues of when they're tired. So I'm learning what physical cues do they give off when fatigue starts to set in, so that if I see it later in the match, I can, I can call for it. I can understand what's happening. So you're studying body language. Then as, as you get more, more into it, you start to look at what are his tactics against this kind of opponent and how do you anticipate they'll change against the athlete that you're putting in front of him. So I try to look for things that an opponent can't change from one match to the other. Hulk with a significant, significant movement here. The minute I saw the brackets, I was like, if John Carlos is going to face anyone in the finals, it's going to be Hulk. Might be significant enough to win. Yes. This is all happening because Barbosa put it here. Put, it, put everything there. Guarantee you that is not what Wagner Rocha wanted to happen. What a match. Here we go. Oh! Your winner and moving on to his first ADCC finals, Lucas the Hulk Barbosa will go on to face Giancarlo Bodani in the finals. Good job, Minton Fortune. Let's go. Let's go. Hulk is a, uh, as the name implies, he's a very, very physical player, and he's someone who does a really, really good job of understanding what his strengths are and playing to his strengths. Doesn't get distracted at all, never gets intimidated by any of his opponents, mentally very, very strong. People talk about his physical strength, but even more impressive is his mental strength. He just, he's just one of those guys who just knows how to win under the rule sets that he engages in. And he had proven that against John Carlo in most of their previous engagements. The first time I fought him was Nogi Pans 2020. It was my first tournament as a black belt. Met him in the finals, ended up losing 2 0. He got a sweep on me. and then he pretty much just body locked me the whole match. So I remember after the, four, the first time that I competed against him and lost, it was twice in the same day, division and absolute. Same thing, he scored two points and then it was just body locked the whole time and just couldn't sweep him. Then I faced him again the following year at Nogi Pans. We met again in the finals and that time I won. It was a back and forth match. I won a narrow decision and you know, that was my first time beating him. So we were two and one at that point. Then we meet again in the semifinals again, repeat of the last one. And again, same kind of story. He wins on those two points and that was kind of the match. And so at that point we're three and one. Then I lose to him again on a decision on like a fight to win. We're four and one. And that was pretty much the story of like pretty much any other of the ones of the matches that he has won. It was always like either a takedown that he scored and then he just made it hard, really hard to score on him. So even if he makes the matches ugly, regardless of who he competes against, he always either finds a way to win or finds a way to make the match hard for the other person. Once it's, the loss happens, like you can linger around as, as long as you want, nothing's going to change it. The only thing that changes is what you do after the loss. So if I win or lose a match, okay, it sucks, but now how are you gonna fix that? Is kind of like how I approach it, especially nowadays. This makes for a difficult preparation. When you have a very slanted record of loss against the person, it's, it's tough to come back and say, okay, it's gonna be different this time. And um, because 
the track record suggests the exact opposite. Like if, if a betting man looked at John Carlo versus Hulk two days before the event, said, which way would you bet? Everyone would have bet on Hulk. And if you had said, I think John Carlo's gonna win by submission after getting a pretty high score without ever being scored on, they would have laughed at you and justifiably so based on past evidence. But what those people didn't see is what John Carlo had been through for a year. And if people had paid very close attention to his progression through local matches and how his submission rate went from extremely low to extremely high in the course of a year, who he was working out with seven days a week, twice a day, then that would change the betting odds. But very, very few people were aware of that. I couldn't wait for the finals. My actually biggest concern, funny enough, was that they were gonna fuck up my name and say my last name wrong like they did all weekend. Giancarlo Bodoni of New Age did do it. I've gotten a chance to watch a lot of Bodoni. Bodoni putting on the pressure right away, forcing Mateos to. Bodoni is a guy who always keeps his composure. Everybody always says Bodini, it's Bodoni and I don't know how people always read it as Bodini. My first two matches, they announced it as Bodini and then Bodini, and then I was like, oh man, this sucks. So I remember texting Seth Daniels. I was like, hey man, make sure Bruce Buffer does not fuck up my name, because I'll be pissed if on the finals of ADCC they mess up my name. And he was like, got it. He did say it right, yeah. He's a pro, so I, I expect nothing less. And now, fighting out of the blue corner from Austin, Texas, making the finals in his first ADCC, representing New Wave, Giancarlo Bodoni! And his opponent fighting out of the red corner from San Diego, California, by way of Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, representing ATOS, the 2019 ADCC bronze medalist, Lucas Hulk Barbosa! All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. 2022 ADCC World Championship. This is the men's under 88 kilograms division. We will look to see who will be the new champion of this division. Calling the action here live from Las Vegas, Nevada. Our big thing for this was, okay, let's start the game with hand fighting. Hulk is a strong hand fighter, but Giancarlo had been taught to be a subtle hand fighter. And the whole thing was do the little things better than the other guy. I, I, I like what Giancarlo's doing. He's, he's getting on the head. He's starting to weigh in on the head. He's getting on the foot play. Um, and I like that. Hulk, Hulk was always heavy on the head. Getting a, a better sense of controlling his opponent's wrist so he couldn't shoot at will. Getting your elbows inside his opponent's elbows so he could dominate the upper body tires. Getting him off your head early and getting onto his head heavy and just doing this for the first minute. So there's a sense in which John Carlo was getting ahead on the hand fight. You can see the difference between how they're dealing with collar ties. Watch the difference. Hulk ducks his head down and straight down to the mat. Giancarlo uses posts on the elbows and keeps his posture up. This is gonna play a big dividend for him. That's a big difference in, in how you deal with these collar ties, whether it wears and tears on your neck. 
the Ashi Wise was a little risky to, to use on a guy who specializes in leg tackles. You can try foot sweeping and not getting tackled, so we didn't, didn't emphasize that too much. It was more about hands, hips back, hands forward. There's a decent bite on that. There was a bite on like a face lock right there, and that's, he tried it at Uke Waza, but it, fa it just failed that time. So my whole thing was to weather the initial storm, and at about seven or eight minutes, I was like, okay, I can start picking up the pace. And little subtle things that you don't see, just like to the naked eye, were what made the difference in that match. Giancarlo, and that's what he wants to do. He's got to get that right elbow to the mat. Now it's getting, even it's getting worse. His shoulder needs to be under the chin. Oh, passes through. Head and arm is locked. Now Hulk gets to the back. Oh, he shrugs him off Beautiful the top, Beautiful escape by Bodoni. The Hulk is cut. And as he started to say, hey, I'm winning the small battles, let's make the progression to the bigger battles. And that's when John Carlos started hitting his takedowns. Nice shot. That was a great shot by Bodoni. That was a great shot. Head, we're head right down the middle. So. I'm not going to say that Hulk was okay with accepting that, but he definitely didn't fight it too yeah. long. He wasn't really willing to defend it. Not that there was a deep double, but he didn't even try to defend it. Now, consciously, it's in the no points period, so it makes sense, but you never see Hulk except bottom position. So that was one thing where I was like, okay, I can put him down. But Dhoni looking unfazed. That's it, he's, he's looking very fresh yeah. right now. Hulk on the bottom. As you mentioned, trying to wrestle up, but Doni shutting it down. Now back to the feet here. I sprawled on one of his shots. He locked a, he came up, he locked a body lock on me. I countered him with an Uchimata, and we were in like a, a kind of like a dog fight situation there, like my underhook versus his overhook. And there was a moment where when I actually flipped him, I got on top and I pushed him down and I walked to the center of the mat. And when I walked to the center of the mat, I saw him coming back and I just saw like that he was pretty much broken. Hulk head standing there with rolls out of bounds. The game had a much more dynamic look to it, which means that fatigue levels go up much faster than they do than if you're just standing over an opponent playing guard position on the ground. Once fatigue levels start going up dramatically, action starts to, starts to get interesting very quickly. And you see people making bigger errors in a state of fatigue, which you can take advantage of. I feel like that's been the secret weapon at New Wave Jiu-Jitsu, and Padoni now on top of home. I hit a back take off the, uh, the go behind, so it took a while for me to actually get underneath the neck, but I was pretty confident that once I was on his back, I could rack up points. Nine to zero for Padoni. Dominating the Hulk here. And once I racked up enough points, I was like, okay, I can really start opening up now and start trying to, to finish him. Because even if he does get out, I was confident that I was ahead on enough points that he wasn't going to be able to like make up the, uh, the difference. You can go palm to palm here too. Palm to palm is good. Forward pressure. You can do it again, John Carlo. Threaten the neck, threaten the neck, distract them on the neck. In there. It's under the chin. The choke is on. And Giancarlo Pizzoni just tapped Lucas Hulk Barboza. The man who dethroned King Kong just defeated the Hulk here in Las Vegas, G. Smith. That was something to see. Beautiful work. From Ladies and gentlemen, though. presenting your down. winner, and new. Didn't waste the opportunity. What about him? Champion Giancarlo Bodoni.
I'm so fucking happy for John Carlo. Uh, I watch him through the camp. He's in there every single day, twice a day. Um, and he's the nicest kid ever. I'm, I'm really, I'm really, really happy for him. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm just ecstatic. I'm more happy for him than I am for myself. And just, you know, to, get, to see one of your, one of your close friends do, do that is uh, very inspiring. I love you so yeah, much. Man. Thank you for everything. Oh, bro. I couldn't do it without you. I swear. Oh, oh, you. Congratulations, oh, Bobby. So much, man. Yeah. So much. Man. This is fucking so much. Yes, sir. How does it feel, man? It feels awesome, man. I couldn't have had a better run. Uh, I was super pumped to be able to get the wins that I got against the opponents that I got. I didn't want to have any easy matches, so I wanted to make sure it was like, wasn't like gonna be like a fluke win or anything, so I got fucking world champion in my first match, ADC champ second match, super tough trials winner, who finished fucking a legend, um, and then Hulk, who's obviously a medalist, multiple time world champion, so I've never been more excited for a tournament combination of like, a little bit of nerves, but just like, good nerves, like I was relaxed the entire weekend and confident the entire weekend, I was just like, I was in the back those last like three hours just waiting. I could not get on the mat and get my hands on him. So this is the happiest I've been in any competition. Social psychology often provides some fascinating material with the experiments. And one of the more interesting ones, at a college in the United States, a large state college, a large group of students came in, and in front of them was a person standing on a stage, and they introduced them as a local professor. After the introduction, they were asked to estimate his height and the average estimation around the room after all the results were collected was around five foot ten. That class left. Another class came in. The same guy was on the stage and they introduced him as a Nobel Prize winner and a world authority on this subject, one of the greatest in history. And his height was estimated at six foot five. And so you see that people's perceptions of reality can be severely impacted by prior beliefs that they hold, by impressions that they have of a given person. People looked at John Carlo previously as just this kind of like positional guy that wasn't very dangerous. And he tended to look at other people as world champions. And he'd always previously believed, I'm just another guy in the room. And when he held that belief, Everyone else believed the same fucking thing. And so just as that crowd overestimated people's heights based on perception, athletes will often overemphasize or overestimate an opponent's ability based on the introduction they have. He's a world champion. Oh my God, he must be amazing. And so many of the people that John Carlo fought at ADCC, he's fought against before. And in the majority of cases, He'd lost to them. And so John Carlo came out with a vision of himself as very different and a vision of them as very different from a year ago. And that created a, a truly memorable run to the gold medal. that you see him get submitted so that was good too like to know that I could submit a guy that was hard to submit and even from the first time that I fought Lucas Barbosa I was never like upset too much that I like lost to him I actually like he was like the first guy that at black belt that I started to compete against that was like a high level guy and so he kind of like set the bar for how I needed to train so in a sense in the early days 
when I was just starting up as a black belt, I would almost train like for him. So in a sense, that rivalry kind of helped push me to to like another level. And every time that we could compete, so I, and I kind of needed him, especially early on, to be able to, you know, break through and, and uh, get to where I am now. In a way, he kind of helped me get better. We're at the Sheepdog Response HQ slash Gracie Humaita Cedar Park, which is the gym owned by Tim Kennedy, where I teach classes at. One of the happiest things about winning ADCC was actually coming back to the gym and just seeing how happy everybody was for me and how like inspired they were. And you could see that it really like impacted them. So that for me was very gratifying. So I'm definitely happy with how I performed at this AD last ADCC, but I can't live in the past and I'm already focused on like my long-term goals the next ADCC. Guys, let's bring it in. Okay, he wants to put me back down so I throw my leg over his back, I sit and we're right back in that same closed guard position and we're ready to finish okay with the arm and guillotine. All right, let's give it a shot. John Carlo is an intellectual and in the seven, eight months of from the first time we, we touched fists and did an MMA round and I was like who is this to him going and to ADC and just mopping the floors with people's souls I got to watch what was an extremely talented athlete and grappler transform into what I believe is he is going to be one of the greatest of all times I mean I feel like I'm just getting started this is kind of like the beginning so I don't I don't see it as I won ADCC, like this is as high as I can go. I feel like this is kind of like only the first thing that I could do. And so for me, that's the most important thing is like how much better can I be six months from now, two years from now, a decade from now. How he would be able to catch people in transitions w was almost something that, you know, we haven't seen since the Gordon, like the, watching Gordon kind of start peaking. Like it's a frightening thing when somebody really peaks like that. And I, I don't think we've reached the pinnacle of where he's at yet either. So I think there's like an asymmetry in, in how this went. For John Carlo, it's like, okay, this is a good first step. For the rest of the world, like, this is a remarkable story. This is pretty damn inspirational. How you can kind of reinvent yourself in a relatively short period of time. You can go from being good to great. He went from being a guy that couldn't even win a local EBI tournament in Boston a year ago, got finished in the first round by someone that no one had ever heard of, to being the guy that just submitted his way to the finals of ADCC, picked up the gold medal. I mean, that's an incredible story. So yeah, if he did that in one year, what can he do in five years? Where would he be five years from now? Part of that will be resolved by who is John Carver?